in order to uh, assist us in, in uh, introducing our speakers, we're provided a little biographical sketch, I'm sure, uh, provided by the speakers themselves. And I was reading over Johnny's, and he says he's been preaching for the San Mateo congregation in California for 15 years. I said, that must be a typo. 15 years? That's an impossibility. <coughs> and I got thinking that my uh, youngest son uh, attended... Uh, began attending uh, Sanford out there in 11 years ago. <coughs> well, he's out now. <laughs> he's, <just out. laughs> he's now a government worker, but uh, nevertheless, that's really where I, I first came to know Johnny and, and certainly to appreciate him and his uh, family and his wife, Pamela, and daughter, Leslie, who's, who's now married uh, to Jeremy Hicks and, and also Andrew, certainly appreciated uh, all of them, and particularly uh, Johnny. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned to uh, uh, respect him greatly for his dedication to the cause of Christ. He, he's a, a great thinker, and he's uh, wanting and willing to serve uh, the Master. And we always enjoy having him in our home. In fact, uh, Johnny and, of course, uh, uh, Skip and Ken, and with uh, Ricky from uh, England, we've solved the problems. We've come up with a plan to resolve all the problems of both the United States and the United Kingdom. <coughs> and we realize implementation may be a problem, but we've got the plan. <laughs> but uh, again, I certainly appreciate Johnny uh, his dedication to the cause of Christ and the fellowship that uh, has been uh, the pleasure of uh, me and uh, Nancy to enjoy over the years. And we anticipate uh, enjoying that fellowship for many years to come. And he is to speak to us this morning on renewal for mission by uh, Hesselbeck, Holloway, and Foster. Johnny, come speak to us. wait till Ken sits down and takes out that check with those royalties I put in there for him. A wonderful introduction. <laughs> That's what I'm worried about. I'm wondering what's under here. <laughs> but um, again, it's always a joy and pleasure to come to be with you, to speak, to fellowship. The encouragement and strengthening that uh, is a result of this lectureship, and it's just a lot of fun to be here. Uh, the other thing, of course, is I always get a little bit of ribbing about coming out here from California. Uh, I understand that that's pure envy on your part, but <laughs> <laughs> and I say that, of course, if you if you have had the opportunity to be out there, it is. A uh, very beautiful place. It is rich in resources. Uh, we'll spend as much <coughs> money as you can give us. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, uh, I always find it kind of funny when the brethren here they say, "Oh, you, you got that crazy Nancy Pelosi and all you know, just all these people." And what you don't realize is that out there, Nancy Pelosi is a conservative. And we have the audacity to bring Jerry ba Brown back again <laughs> on his campaign promise to let us vote on higher taxes. Now, who could do that but a Californian? Uh, one of the things, of course, that we have seen in this election and the previous one, Profiles and Apostasy, uh, is the fact that what we read about in, in Jude, where he would certainly love to uh, always have been encouraging to the brethren talking about the common salvation where he would love to uh, have written to those brethren about those things that uh, exhilarate us, the things that build us up, the things that, that help to strengthen us in Christ. And, and a lot of times, in the, even in your local congregations, you understand 
uh, how a lot of times people, the members of the congregation feel they want, they'll say, oh, a more positive message, more upbeat message. And uh, Jude said, but I've got to talk to you, brethren, about contending for the faith. He says, that's what we have to talk about. And what I found in San Mateo, and maybe some of you have found in your own congregations, is that you go back through those, those subjects and profiles uh, one, and a lot of members of the congregations are absolutely stunned that anyone could have these views, could think like that, could write like that, could actually try to uh, perpetrate those views in the brotherhood. He said, well, here it is right here. And we went through some of those, uh, some of your lessons from last year and went over them into classes and people were falling off their chairs. They just could not believe that people in the church or people who had once been in the church actually could think these things. And yet here we are again, and uh, certainly if the elders and David uh, wanted to do so, they could probably roll these out for five more years. You think there's fruit and nuts in California? I mean, look all over the brotherhood. We got we got more fruits and nuts, you know, with these things. Everything that you've written uh, and talked about so far, it just imagine that. And they're not all in California. And so, my responsibility was to. I think David was a little bit kinder to me this year. He gave me. Uh, a book that was written by three men who don't know anything rather than one who, uh, last year. <laughs> the Concise History, uh, Renewal for Missions, The Concise History of the Christian Churches and the Churches of Christ. And I started out in the manuscript looking at two verses that I sort of come back to and sort of anchor the whole uh, essay or manuscript. One, of course, John 17 and 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. And Jesus in, actually, in John chapter 17 continues to talk about unity. And in this book, and we'll talk about it uh, a little bit more as we go along, the idea of unity at any cost is what these brethren, what these men are actually hoping to achieve. And this is, this is one of the uh, more uh, insidious of, of many doctrines that we find in the church today. The second, of course, is one from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 13, which gives us also an idea of what Jesus means with regard to unity. Paul writing to the brethren in Corinth. And he says to those brethren that you all speak the same thing and that you be of the same, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. And so when there is unity being spoken of in the scriptures, whether it be by Christ or the apostles, it is with that in mind. Unity, where we speak the same thing and are of the same mind and same judgment. When we look at the, the book itself, and I, I just didn't bring that book. I think some of you brethren brought it because you're gonna leave it here somewhere or throw it in the trash can. I'm not really sure what the point was. Maybe at the end we'll have a, a book burning as they used to. But the, the title of the book, Renewal of Mission, that's a misnomer. It, it's, it's another attempt, another attempt by men to change the history that is a true history of the Lord's Church into something that will be more accommodating to their desires. That's the whole point of false teaching, is to change the truth of the Bible to something more accommodating, more uh, comfortable for, for man. And we look at these, I call them in the book, the three musketeer authors. Uh, Helsebeck from the Christian Church, Holloway, uh, I think he's at Lubbock, and uh, Douglas Foster, who uh, supposed to be a big historian at Abilene. I mean, those names themselves indicate the level of intellectual acumen that these men really possess. Sometimes you think PhD stands for really something else. Poor headless dummies. <laughs> uh, 
and, and yet this is, this is the kind of thing that, the, that people begin to, to go toward. They represent various segments of apostasy. And this idea that they are looking at trying to take and co-opt what was and is described as the Restoration Movement. They try to co-opt that for these unity movements of the Christian churches and the uh, Churches of Christ, or the more liberal bent side of the church. People who are interested in instrumental music, people who are interested in women serving in the church uh, in capacities for which there's no scriptural authority. And I look at this and, and, and continuing to read it and wonder how do these people, it's very difficult, and I think you brethren probably agree, it's really hard to understand how these people actually think this way. How can you actually think that these ideas that you're putting together, and, so, and we're mentoring Elphegard Smith, and here's a man who I seriously wonder if he's not uh, seeing medical uh, attention in some way, if he can go in to a denominational church, as Brother Brown said. He goes over to England in a denominational church. He is there while they're playing music, but he doesn't hear any music. Now, I came in the other day, and Buddy, I don't know what Buddy was doing. I, I know it was because of Terry. <laughs> and Terry has been very subdued. <laughs> you, you, you brethren should make sure that his wife comes with him every time. <laughs> in the book as, as it opens one of the things that uh, is incredulously, incredulously asked at the very onset aren't we the church of the first century and you would wonder why they would consider asking that question in the, at the very beginning of the book since they're going to go in a direction that completely contradicts everything that it said on page 10, you don't have to go very far into the book. On page 10, it's, we have this statement. And I, I just want to read some of these statements. I, I kept trying to figure out how am I going to fashion this into, I uh, can't fashion it into a sermon. It's a book review. But I said, I'm just going to read some of the things that these men said. Let it, it answers itself. One of their statements is, studying history now just, just think about this. Studying history can help us understand the Bible. We prize the authority of the Bible because those who went before us taught us to respect it. And as I read that, I, I thought about this. It came to me pretty quickly, and I don't know why it didn't why it take so long for them to understand it, but understanding the Bible, it's not dependent on history. Rather, the scriptures establish and verify and give us a better understanding of history. The authority of, of the Bible is not dependent on someone else's respected, handed down, presumably those in the Restoration Movement of whom they speak. God's word is authoritative because it is God's word. Man writes history, but God writes the Bible. And their respect seems to be, their, their uh, activity seems to be directed toward, uh, this is what these men said, this is what these men did, and we're following these men because it is their view of Scripture that we want to carpet onto our own agenda. And we look at their, their fallacy, with regard to the doctrine, John 17, Romans 16, 17, 1 Timothy 4, 16, 1 Timothy 6, 3, Titus 2, 10, Hebrews 6, 1, 2 John 1, 9. Speak about the importance, the, the, the preeminence of doctrine. And when we look at those scriptures, and we look here at what these men, as they, what they say and what they do, and how they have so little value for the scripture. They have no real interest in doctrine. If you hold to doctrine, if you are concerned about doctrine, if you love doctrine, if you preach and teach doctrine, these brothers view you as suspicious. 
I remember I'd mentioned it in an email exchange with Bill Sanders and the way that he was writing about the relationship between the Christian church and the churches of Christ. And Phil Sanders in an email to me, he said, well, uh, people don't always, uh, people don't, who don't always agree on doctrine or can be in the same body. And he said, the independent Christian church is to the churches of Christ as the seven churches of Asia. I said, he's got one of those PhDs. He said, well, those people preach the same doctrine that we do. I said, yeah. You know, Reagan said, there he goes again. <laughs> he says, lady comes in and, and she wants to become a member of the Church of Christ. She's already in the independent church. We don't see any need to baptize her. And this idea of unity, you can see where it's going in the church and with a lot of young men. And so the authors here on pages 14 and 15 made a statement that you nearly fall out. They said that the Roman Catholic Church was in fact the church for centuries. And all along the way in the book they said they acknowledged the institutional that this institution apostatized. They, they said you have the, the various uh, errors, the Belief in purgatory, the intercession of saints, the power of the priest to absolve from temporal punishment of sin. And they said that we owe these people, we in the Lord's church owe these people a considerable debt. I thought they collected their debts and indulgences. But they had the audacity to say that, that we owe them a debt. And I use a number of words to describe these people as uh, distasteful and the way they use the word Christian to identify apostates. And that's what they felt very comfortable doing. It didn't really matter how you moved away from truth. They considered you to be Christian to be a part of that one large ecumenical universal church that all has a belief, a feeling about Jesus Christ. And in the first chapter, they remind the reader that we in America were not the first Christians. I think we knew that. And that the people that were responsible for these different departures from the faith should be viewed as, this is what they said, the people who had departed from the faith should be viewed as our spiritual ancestors. I think I use the words ignoramuses and infidels to describe these people. Because it's obvious that they don't have any biblical integrity whatsoever. Do you feel that you owe the Catholic Church anything? Do you feel that you owe any people who depart from the truth, roll all, all over into the fields of error? Do we owe them any debt? No. They go on to talk about the dawning of America. And they ask, they really ask a good question. I think it's a question that, that even today is, is one that to resonate back over into Europe having become sophisticated. Why is religion in America different from religion in Europe and the rest of the world? People in the United States take religion seriously, at least those in the body of Christ, those who are still fighting for the truth, contending for the faith, those who find out, and we find ourselves more and more marginalized in society more and more concerned about where the country is going, if you're concerned. But then they unveil the motive for the travesty in the first place. On page 24, a statement that essentially divulges everything you knew to be true, but no one would tell you. That the pure, unadulterated gospel 
means nothing to these people, and unity means everything to the people who subscribe to this particular heresy. Here's a quote that the author uh, the authors use in their de definition of the restoration movement. And this is, again, where they go in this particular book. I wish that they had put their names, put their names on what they wrote. But since they didn't, we'll figure they're all about as... <clears throat> what most also had in common was agreement on the purpose of restoration. Now, now, listen to this portion. To be the pure church of the Bible was not an end in itself. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to be like the Bible in the first century. We don't want to be like the, the we don't want to be like Antioch. We don't want to be like the, the churches established by the Apostle Paul on the missionary. We don't want to be like the, the pure church of the Bible was not an end in itself. The purpose of restoring the church was to reach unity among Christians that Christ prayed for. Then they follow with this quote from John 17, 21, without the least indication that what Jesus said and what they were promoting were diametric opposites. The unity for which Christ prayed required the church to be pure. When the, when the Lord prays for unity, it again goes back to what we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. When the Lord speaks of unity, that we all may be one, he in thee and, and, and we in him, it is that we have that same mind and same judgment. That we speak the same thing. These men deny that that is the purpose of unity. And they have grabbed and gravitated toward Brother Barton Stone. And he is the hero of the Christian churches and the independent Christian churches and the Churches of Christ movement. And they take, as was mentioned earlier, they take some of the things that he had said, some of the positions that he had held, some of the indications that, that he had given early in his life, and they use that as the foundation. For their movement. And the disgusting thing about this in the book is that they never do come around and acknowledge any change in his points of view, even though he openly admits that he changed on a number of points. They go on to say, I believe it's page 24 in the book that the differences on the matters of doctrine must not get in the way of unity. That pretty much easily covers everything, doesn't it? Doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you do, how you do it, when you do it. As long as we have a unity, loosely described as it is, then we all are in fellowship with one another. Here's a statement that certainly they point to for justification of their uh, unity mantra. It says that the Cane Ridge revival had a profound effect on Stone and others. It convinced them of the importance of Christian unity. Okay, so far as it goes. If the Spirit could come in response to the Baptist, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, then the differences between these denominations must not be matters of the gospel. The unity among Christians produced by the Spirit should be the goal of all who claim or come to follow Christ. I think if you, brethren, went back to your various uh, congregations and began to preach this doctrine, you wouldn't have enough pews. You, 
we'd all be Joel Osteen's. <laughs> then they take a statement that was made by stone and, and they, they, they position it so that this again gives further credence to their view. Let Christian unity be our polar star. And so they concoct this history, this rewrite of what had been previously written by Lerone Garrett, the Stone Campbell Movement back in 1981. And they rehashed the same material for this new generation of vipers. And they go on to discuss the things that, that are a part of, uh, come out of that book. And it is impossible that, that anyone reading this book could not be aware of their attempts to rewrite the history of this movement. Barton Stone on various points, infant baptism, communion, the Godhead, at various points along the way, how he comes to a clearer understanding of the truth, but, reno but renewal of mission blithely moves through time as though this never happens. You could come away from reading this book without having any inclination that Barton Stone admitted to being baptized for the remission of sin. The book goes on in its attack of Alexander Kemp. They, tell, they say that Alexander Campbell, by insisting that baptism for the remission of sin was the only path into the Lord's church, was a monster of intolerance. Let me back that up. Read that again. By insisting that baptism for the remission of sin was the only path into the Lord's church a monster of intolerance. Later, Foster's team comes to admit that, that Stone came around to Campbell's uh, scriptural positions on that in the end. I include in the, in the manuscript, it's in the book, uh, a letter by Barton Stone in response to a request to drop a subscription to the Christian Messenger. If read that, because Stone is accused of having uh, forsaken the the movement, and he's accused of a number of things, a number of positions, a number a number of diversions from from what uh, they have been led to believe his views on baptism for remission of sin, his views. His search for the right path. And some of them, of course, he admits to needing to be reevaluated. And when he moved away from errors, others practically accused him of treason. Now, I think that what Brother Stone, uh, what Barton Stone did, is something that really would would be a great example for some of the brothers in the brotherhood today who won't admit to error, who won't admit that the, the things that they've done, the positions that they've taken, the teaching that they have engaged in, that that may have been wrong and they need to repent. He had the courage to admit he was wrong. He had the courage to admit he had gone off in the wrong direction. His, his interpretation, his understanding was incorrect. He moved to the right position. The other day, when Brother Hatcher was up here and he was reading a letter that he had received in response to an editorial that he, that he had written, and the person said, well, if he goes that way, so do I. And you'd have to ask, brethren, if you went back to your congregation and said, well, from now on, I'm not going to preach baptism for the remission of sin. Let's just go that way. And everybody gets up and goes along with you. Is that what you'd want? 
You'd want them to sit you down, dress you down, and say, brother, that's error. Wouldn't you want the members of your congregation to tell you if you had gone off into error? Wouldn't you want them to tell you that? You bet you would. I know David Brown, if he, if he spoke on a position and, and went off into an uh, inerrant position or something, he'd want the elders of the congregation to say, David, that's not right. I know we all like to think we're right all the time. Aren't you right all the time? I mean, the only person I know is right all the time is Terry. Terry's right all the time. <laughs> of course, Dub's too old to be wrong, so that doesn't even <laughs> But again, it, 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 we look at these people and we look at how uh, in that letter that Stone writes, he explicitly demonstrates the importance of doctrine over unequivocal unity. What's more important, doctrine or unity? And it's not hard to see that. But even today, and again, we go back to this initial point, when you look at what is the truth, what does the Bible say? And we found, brethren, they can't figure out which way to go. Well, reaffirmation, re-election of elders, is it wrong or not? Well, let me see. If he said it's all right, it must be all right. What does the Bible say? Is there any authority for it? Well, I guess he repented. No, he didn't repent. Some said he said he repented. Some said he didn't repent. See, they don't know which way to go. Go with what the Bible says. For the thus saith the Lord. And today we find ourselves in, in so many different situations because that's not what people apply. They don't apply what the Bible says. They look out and find what some person is doing. Page 79, a sentence that exemplifies this sort of deceptive intellectual dishonesty, the rubbish that's in this book. In 1830, they say, Barton Stone worried that insisting on immersion, now this is how the world and the denominational world feels today, Barton Stone worried that insisting on immersion could be, insisting on immersion could become a one-item sectarian creed that would exclude more Christians from union than any creed in existence. Immersion. People say they're Christians but never been baptized. We don't want to argue with that. They never came back to inform the reader of any change in Stone's position that might jeopardize their own agenda. They just leave it there. Never mind that the previously included letter in the book by Stone explains his understanding that baptism is essential not only for the remission of sin, but also for entrance into the Lord's church. They left that out. They didn't want anybody to, to eventually see that. That might change some mind, might bring some people back into the Bible. They're perpetuating a fraud in this book. Page 82 in the book, they say that baptism is merely an expression of saving that's all it is. It's not for remission of sins. It's because you've already been saved. And we know that, that early on that Barton Stone, a man in search of both unity and truth, but his unity did not come at the expense of truth. Times earlier in his life, his positions were not quite clearly formed. He admitted as much. And the shame in this book is that we have these men, these writers, 
who wish to sully the name of Stone and others by placing them in a, in a poster board position for a unity movement that has no real concerns for the gospel as it's presented in the New Testament. They have a blatant disregard for truth and they'll have to answer to the Lord on the day of judgment for the many souls that they have led into this condemnation. Now that's one thing that we do have to realize and consider is that all of these people from F. Lagarde Smith, from Dave Miller, all of these people are going to have to answer to the Lord for what they've done. They're going to have to answer for all of those who they've led astray. They're going to have to answer for all of those people. Next portion of my thoughts this morning, I titled them, What Then, What Now, and What When? They go off, when once they get past the Civil War, this book goes downhill pretty fast. It was downhill from the start, but it accelerates. And they go through a lot of uh, introductions on instrumental music and worship, uh, the excuses that they use for women to serve, uh, song leading, saying prayers in the worship and so forth, various liberal positions taken by. Now they did pull up one man's name that they had obviously fallen in love with. His name, uh, T.B. Lattimore. And, and here's the thing about him that was in, he refused to declare himself publicly on any divisive issue because he thought that they were no, of no importance to the unity of the body. He wouldn't take a position. I guess they like that. I'm sure the Jew when he said, contend for the faith once delivered. He didn't expect some mamsy pamsy Casper milk toast to stand up there and say, well, whatever you want, I don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to upset anyone. How are you going to get them to repent? How are we going to get someone convicted of the need to come out of sin into the Lord's glorious church. If people don't get upset about where they are now, they'll never be saved. And when we preach and teach the gospel, people have to understand that there is a, there is a such thing as sin. They're whitewashing the boards now. There is no sin. Didn't you know that? There is no sin. And we see this going all the way through the government now. I don't want to get into any political things except that I think everybody can see that the whole intent behind some of these rulings and some of these movements is to make a, a larger unity movement. A unity movement in the country where there's no such thing as right and wrong, there's no such thing as sin. If you, get, if you eliminate certain things, I hope that you saw, I hope that you saw that uh, interview, Joel Osteen interviewed on TV. I think the liberal who interviewed him, Piers Morgan, he was expecting and hoping for a different answer. He asked, he asked uh, Joe Osteen if homosexuality was a sin. I've never seen that man squirm so much in his life. I think he actually has some sweat coming out from behind that powdered face he had. He eventually had to answer the question he, that he thought that the Bible teaches that homosexuality was a sin. Yeah, I said it. It's a sin. The commentator, he was, he was visibly upset. He says, are you going to tell me that my friend, now this was what the, you're going to tell me my friend Elton John 
is in sin. Well, I mean, that was the way it went. He, he, he was hoping to, you know, get a coup, hoping to have Osteen say, oh, I'm not going to say it's a sin. He was hoping for that because we're trying to erase that. We're not going to defend marriage anymore as between a man and a woman. Not you, of course, but you know, the government has decided we're not going to defend that anymore. Why? You know what's going to happen, brethren? It's going to come back. They're going to try to wipe the name of Christ off the face of the earth in the United States if we let them. <clears throat> the comment that they make, he would not break relations with those who were wrong on issues. Lattimore. Was baptism for the remission of sin, Brother Douglas? No, I don't think so. Well, we're still in fellowship, brother. You and my, you know, we're still unified in our belief that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you think there's more than one church? Absolutely. Well, bless you. Because we still know that, that Jesus is the head of the church, except if, if you're Catholic. And then bless him. That seems to be the view. On one of these points, on page 105, the writers admit. Now this is one of the things that is astonishing. They admit, they fully admit to no understanding of the word inerrant with respect to the scriptures. They said they don't understand it. It took, them, it took them that long to write it down. You could tell from page two. It said that they, it said this in part because they are determined to attack fundamentalism which argue for reading the Bible literally and affirming that the scriptures were inerrant. They ascribe that as an evil domain of religious sectarianism. If you say that the Bible is inerrant, you are an evil sectarian. I just want you brethren to know who you were. Every time I thought about uh, this, and they, and they describe, of course, Lattimore this way, and, th and this is what they said, and this is what I think people still, I was reminded of John West when he I was talking about that, about Pepperdine. And this they said, if everyone in his day, talking about Lattimore, if everyone in his day, and this obviously is how they feel, if everyone in his day had imitated his attitude of not taking a position, of not taking a stand for the truth, it said that the issues would have never divided us. That's probably true, isn't it? If he, if everyone, now just move that into right now. If you brethren out there, if you don't take a stand, you won't have any problems. Your congregational size will go from, from 30 to 300, from 50 to 500. Your coffers will be filled. You'll be able to do amazing works, missionaries everywhere. All you have to do is not take a stand for the truth. All you have to do is not let Someone like Dave Miller be a, de a divisive issue. All you have to do is accept error, whether it's from the left. Well, it's always from the left. Because what we try to do is right. And so, I know that when I step down, I know that, I know that Dave... Where is Dave? David's got another 10, 15 minutes he'll give you some. But I, I thank you, brethren, for indulging and listening to this. This was a, a absolutely disgusting uh, book to read. And these
these writers for their attempts at being intellectual fail miserably. And that's what we're facing in the Brotherhood. These, these people who are writing simply for the sake of writing, they hate, they are enemies of the cross. That's who they are. Thank you. Certainly appreciate that uh, uh, incisive analysis of this particular piece of apostasy. It would seem to be that uh, uh, their thinking is that the problems are not in <coughs> matters of doctrine. The problems emanate from actually pointing out uh, error in matters of doctrine. So uh, thank you, Johnny, for that. Uh, uh, for sake of time, we're not going to let either Terry or David say anything. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll, uh, it's already 11 o'clock the time that we should be starting again, so if you would, just uh, hang around and we'll, we'll get started as soon as, as we can. Thank you.